Welcome to another video produced by Raw Footage. My name is Colin Gaisley and I come from Bath in the southwest of England. And this is a companion video to the ones I produced as an Oscar preview. In those Oscar preview videos, I repeatedly said that the criteria for inclusion on those videos was whether or not a film or a performance appeared on the lists on goldderby.com, which I do believe is the best source for awards predictions online. But there is a much wider cinematic world out there than the things that the Hollywood industry as represented by goldderby.com, feel is worthy of inclusion in the Oscars. And there are some great films and great performances out there which do not end up on those Gold Derby lists and I think are worthy of notice. So I'm trying to address the balance here by showing the completely obscure and completely undiscovered performances out there which I think should be in serious contention for the Oscars. In every case in this video, to the best of my knowledge, the films were released in the US during 2021 and therefore should and could have been eligible for the 2022 Oscar ceremony. The only exceptions to this are the documentary and international feature categories where I'm selected films which were on the eligible lists but did not make the 15 film shortlist and also the animated feature list where I'm using the same 23 film long eligible list that I used in my Oscar preview video so that's going to be a bit of a repeat but I wanted to include all the major categories. So here is in my opinion, a list of films which should be considered Oscar contenders, but in no universe would have been. Best Film Zebra Girl is a British film which did get a limited US release in 2021 and could have been eligible for the Oscars. But I do grant you it is a film which has split opinion. The way it handles its subject matter of mental illness has raised questions in certain corners. But personally speaking, I think it's brilliant. It's blending of jet black comedy and genuine tragedy worked really well for me when i realized the directions this film was going towards the end it absolutely broke me brilliant central performance from sarah roy who also performed the same role on stage which this is an adaptation of the original stage play but it is a film that for me absolutely works it has the horror it has the humor it has questions about love and relationships and whether or not it is enough to simply love somebody and maybe it isn't so zebra girl i think should have been eligible for the oscars and i think should have been in serious contention best foreign film bad luck banging or loony porn was submitted by romania to the international feature competition for this cycle and it was considered something of a contender since it did win the 2020 berlin golden bear but it did not make the 15 film shortlist which really surprised me and upset me because i think bad luck banging or loony porn is a brilliant film a biting dissection of romanian society and culture and by extension, a biting expose of world society and culture, particularly during the pandemic, but also dealing with the way sexuality is treated in the modern day. As a high school 
teacher has to face a kangaroo court of concerned parents when a sex tape she has made with her husband gets leaked to her class. And the questions that get raised about privacy and sexuality and protection of children are brilliantly discussed. But what really makes this film sing for me personally is the middle section of this film, which is in three separate chapters, in which director Radu Jude creates a glossary of terms, or as he says, a list of anecdotes, signs and wonders, of various things which are affecting modern Romanian culture and society, and by extension world culture and society. The rise of fascism, the rise of misogyny, the rise of authoritarianism, the ways that violence and sexuality are intermingled and treated differently. It's really, really powerful stuff. Very angry, a little bit pretentious, a little bit ostentatious, but I think it really works. And for me, Bad Luck Banging or Looney Porn is an excellent film, and I think it was significantly better than some of the films that actually did get nominated for the International Feature Oscar this year, but it didn't even make the shortlist. Best Animated Film This is something of a repeat of the Oscar preview video I've already released, because all I can do is work off the same 26 film long eligible list that I was working on with the Oscar preview show. So I will simply remind you that Pupel of Chimney Town, the Japanese animation, is brilliant, but it was never actually going to get an Oscar nomination. It's based on a very successful Japanese picture book and has the feel of a picture book come to life with a much more textured much richer feel and look than you typically get with either the glossy 3D CG animated style or the flat, bold 2D cell-drawn style. This is somewhere in between, and it's beautiful. It's also very politically interesting, with a strong theme of this film being standing up to authoritarianism which in the modern day is very, very important. So it works as a kid-friendly film of a boy and his friendship with a trash monster, but there's also something for the adults in the themes of false information and standing up to authoritarianism and deciding for yourself where your life should go. So. It's a film which has so many different layers, and all of them are excellent. And for me, Pupel of Chimney Town was definitely one of the best eligible films this year in the animated feature category. Best Documentary The Netflix documentary Pray Away was on the list of eligible films that was published by the Academy but did not make the 15 film shortlist. And I think it deserved a lot more attention than it got, because this is a devastating documentary dealing with gay conversion therapy. And one particular church which advocated this practice, but eventually collapsed after enough people protested about it and enough of the leaders of this group were confronted by the damage they had done to people and basically wrapped it up. And we talk in this documentary to some of those people who spent years, if not decades, believing that gay conversion therapy worked, it was helping people, and not psychologically damaging and traumatising people, in certain cases all the way to suicide. And these people dealing with their past, dealing with what they did to gay people previously, most of them are now living with homosexual partners, and yet this gay conversion therapy goes on. So 
having both sides of the argument, the people this was done to, and the people who did it, and now regret it, this is a powerful, brilliant documentary. It is kind of a harrowing documentary, but I do think it's brilliant. And Pray Away on Netflix is a documentary which I think should have got a lot more attention at the Oscars. Best Actor Amir El Masri plays a Syrian refugee in the British film Limbo, who has been shoved off to a remote, windswept Scottish island whilst his asylum claim is being processed. Along with many other single men from places like Afghanistan and Nigeria, it's a situation where the boredom and the frustration quickly sets in, but also the guilt. He managed to get out of Syria whilst his family didn't, and he has phone conversations with his family back in Syria, which doesn't help his mental state. He carries around an oud with him, a Middle Eastern stringed instrument, but he doesn't play it because it sounds wrong. And the way that Amir al Masri manages to encompass the whole of the refugee slash immigrant experience is brilliantly handled in Ben Sharrock's film Limbo. His acting is very understated, it's very simple, but the depth of emotion, the depth of pain that goes through Amir al Masri's face with very little dialogue or relatively little dialogue, is incredibly impressive to see. I thought it was an excellent acting performance, but in common with many of the performances I will be talking about in this video, because it wasn't in an American film, it got overlooked. But Amir al Masri, in my opinion, was Oscar nomination worthy, or certainly in consideration for an Oscar nomination for his performance in the film Limbo. Best Actress Noemi Milan has been getting a certain amount of international attention over recent years for her performances in ensemble pieces like in Celine Sciamma's film Portrait of a Lady on Fire last year and this year in Jacques Odiard's new film Paris 13th District. But in between those two films, Noemi Milan appeared in the Belgian film Jumbo in a leading role, and I think she was outstanding. There were many reasons why this was never going to get an actual Oscar nomination. A, because it's Belgian, and B, because it's very, very strange. Telling the story of a strange young woman who falls in love with a fairground ride, who she dubs Jumbo. And exploring this unusual woman who has this unusual sexuality, being attracted to inanimate objects. And throughout the course of the film, you get hints here and there that it's not just this giant Wurlitzer which has aroused her interest. She just likes inanimate objects, that's her thing. And Noemi Milan plays it with such subtlety, with such grace. And writer-director Zoe Whittock does not judge this character for her unusual sexuality. She just explores it and showing how this quirky young woman can find satisfaction with an inanimate object, a giant inanimate object, and the consequences for her family, for her friends, I mean, not that she really has any friends, but her acquaintances at least. Noemi Milan at every point plays it with such believability that you completely buy that it just so happens this young woman likes inanimate objects, and is she really doing any harm? Should we really judge her for this? And that's a legitimate question in the film Jumbo. And I think the performance of Noemi Merlin is outstanding. 
and personally speaking, I think it was worthy of consideration at the Oscars, although that was never, ever going to happen. Best Supporting Actor While most of the individuals I'll be talking about in this video are overlooked because they're in non-American films, Chaske Spencer is in an American film, it's just so tiny that nobody was paying attention to it. Wild Indian tells the story of two Native American boys growing up on a reservation in Wisconsin who do something terrible, or are involved in something terrible. One of them grows up to be Chaske Spencer, who has spent his life in and out of jail, is clearly still traumatised and guilt-ridden by what he did in his youth, but the other boy, who is also his cousin, has grown up to be Michael Grey Eyes, who is now happily assimilated into white society in California. And when Chaske Spencer goes to visit his cousin, Michael Grey Eyes, in California, their lives start collapsing around them. And, yeah, the way that Chaske Spencer portrays the traumas and the guilt that he feels about the dangerous things he did in his past is exceptionally well done. Chaske Spencer isn't actually in the film Wild Indian very much. This is very much Michael Gray Eyes' film. But Chaske Spencer has a crucial role to play, and the emotional breakdown that we see Chaske Spencer go through as he gets out of jail, struggles to find a minimum wage job, and then eventually goes out to California in order to talk to his cousin. And we see that Michael Gray Eyes actually doesn't particularly feel too bad about what he did in his youth. And is possibly even something of a psychopath, but Chaske Spencer plays this guilt-ridden, traumatised man brilliantly, showing how difficult it is for Native Americans in modern America, and also showing how difficult it is for ex-cons in modern America. And at every point, Chaske Spencer plays it brilliantly, and I think he deserved a lot more attention for his acting performance in Wild Indian and maybe even should have got a nomination for Best Supporting Actor. Best Supporting Actress Dance of the 41 is a Mexican historical drama which recounts the story of a real-life scandal which happened in 1901, where the son-in-law of the President of Mexico was arrested alongside 41 other gay men, many of whom were in drag, at a dance held at a big house in Mexico City. And Mabel Cadena plays the wife of said son-in-law of the president. Mabel Cadena plays the illegitimate but acknowledged daughter of the president, and she knows that part of the reason that she has been married off to this rising political star is for the advantage her husband can get being the son-in-law of the president. She knows that's part of the deal, but initially she doesn't realise that her husband has absolutely no sexual interest in her whatsoever. So this woman is suddenly trapped in a gilded cage, I mean, in this beautiful house, in Mexico City, but with no outlet for her passions, no sexual release whatsoever. And she doesn't handle it well, I mean, as you wouldn't. I mean, what kind of life would you anticipate having? And she gets very religious, she tries to pray the gay away, <laughs> similar to the documentary earlier. And when that obviously doesn't work, she starts getting vindictive. And, yeah, this blending of the wronged woman. I mean, she has definitely been wronged, but she goes pretty far in getting revenge on her husband and her husband's lover. And that complicated blending 
of the sympathy we feel for her and the antagonism we feel for her because she goes arguably too far in getting revenge on her husband. So there's a push and pull of sympathy and repulsion for this character. And in my opinion, Mabel Cadena plays it exceptionally well. But because it was in a foreign language film that ended up on Netflix, the Academy was not going to pay attention to it. Although Mabel Cadena did get a Best Actress nomination at the Ariel Awards in Mexico, so that at least is something. But I think Mabel Cadena was one of the best supporting actress performances in this eligible time period. Best Director I tried to include as much variety in this video as possible, but the best option for a snub for Best Director that wasn't listed on the Gold Derby list was a film I've already talked about, Limbo, as directed by Ben Sharrock, who puts such an interesting style on this film. It's very stylized, it's very mannered, Every single frame is constructed brilliantly, in my opinion, reminding me in a lot of ways of Wes Anderson, that very mannered, very symmetrical approach that Wes Anderson always has. Not nearly as colourful as Wes Anderson, indeed I think Limbo is a rather bleak film, and deliberately a bleak film, a rather washed out piece of cinematography. But the style adds to the substance of the film. And showing these stylized things that Amir El Masri and his friends have to go through adds to the construction of the strange limbo world in which Amir El Masri is living. And I think Ben Sharrock did an excellent job of directing limbo with enough flair that I do think he was worthy of a Best Director nomination, or at least consideration, as Best Director at this year's Oscars. Best Adapted Screenplay Again, while wanting to be as broad as possible with this video, the best option for a snub for Best Adapted Screenplay is another film I've already talked about, Zebra Girl as written by the original playwright Derek Ahanan, who created a one-woman show, Catherine and Anita, alongside the star of this film, Sarah Roy, and then eventually adapted that one-woman play into this feature film, and adapted it very, very well. Without knowing that it started out as a one-woman play, you really can't tell. But... Once you do know, you can see what's been added, what's been shifted around. And I think Derek Ahanen did an excellent job of turning this into basically a three-handed film and showing all the different angles that the mental deterioration of the main character goes through, the devastating revelations. You can kind of see some of the stuff that goes on in this film, particularly given the title but I think Derek Ahanen did an excellent job of screenwriting and also did an excellent job of adapting his own play for the big screen. And in my opinion, he deserved serious consideration for Best Adapted Screenplay at the Oscars. Best Original Screenplay What won the Oscar? for Best Original Screenplay last year, and deservedly so, was Emerald Fennell's Promising Young Woman. But in my opinion, a film that covered a lot of the same ground, as good if not better than Promising Young Woman, was Lucky, written by Bria Grant. Bria Grant actually had a really, really good year of releases in the UK in 2021. She wrote and starred in the film Lucky, she wrote and directed the thriller 12 Hour Shift, and she also co-starred in the slasher movie The Stylist, 
all of which, to one degree or another, I do recommend. And Bria Grant has co-written and stars in another film which has just got released in the US called Madeleines, which hopefully I'll be able to see at some point in the UK because I'm really impressed with what Bria Grant managed to do. Telling the story of a self-help author played by Bria Grant, who is nightly being attacked by a masked killer. But in the morning, the killer disappears and nobody believes her. It's a perfect and a chilling metaphor for women not being believed when they are attacked and being attacked in the first place. This is definitely a film about misogyny using the tropes of the slasher movie, using the framework of horror in order to tell a very important story. And in my opinion, telling that story very, very well. It's just that this was never, ever going to get the attention that something like Promising Young Woman did. A, because it's essentially a horror film, and B, because it's a horror film, it ended up on Shudder.com. So, Nobody was paying any strong attention to it, which I think is a shame because Lucky has some incredibly impactful, incredibly thought provoking things to say, and it also works as a slasher movie. So, Bria Grant managed to do something very, very impressive in writing this film and starring in it. It's a film that you should seek out, and because it's you know, a genre film, it gets pushed to the side, but it actually has some very, very valuable things to say. And I think Lucky is just as good as, if not better, Promising Young Woman, covering some of the same subject. So, yeah, if you want your horror movies thought-provoking and feminist, Lucky is definitely one to check out. So, with the exception of the animated feature category, where I was just using the 26 film list published by Ampass, there are Oscar-worthy films and performances which were not even listed on the Gold Derby list of Oscar potential, and by extension, were never ever going to get Oscar nominations. The Academy tends to be rather insular. It tends to only award and pay attention to a particular type of film. If it's not American, if it's not produced by a major studio, or if it's not had a decent run at a prestigious film festival, it just gets ignored. And really, really good films and really good performances get completely overlooked simply by the politics and the popularity contest that the Oscars so often is. So do pay attention to the darker corners of the cinematic and streaming universe because you do find stuff that is well worth watching. And hopefully this video has given you some ideas as to where to go. So that brings me to the end of this video and all that remains for me to say is see you next time where I shine a light on cinema, both obvious and obscure.